the Steampunk Death Rattle channel. This is the only channel that celebrates steampunk, that wonderful fictional blend of sci-fi and history. <laughs> so, usually we talk about sci-fi, fantasy, but we also talk about history. <laughs> we go both directions in time, you know, past and future. And today, it's an auspicious day. I mean, it's a it's a important day in America and other parts of the world, November 11th, which is called Veterans Day, and the day that we're supposed to think about our veterans and uh, what they sacrificed and, and uh, you know, think about their welfare and so on. But at the same time, it's really called Armistice Day because it was the day that the Great War ended, which we also call the First World War. And it's interesting because this is a case where the traditionalists won out. The the U.S. government was trying to make all the holidays uniform. You know, I mean, didn't that kind of take the fun out of things? You know, they they were making everything uniform. They all had to fall on Monday, so we, we the federal workers would have a three-day weekend. And uh, actually, I get those three-day weekends nowadays. Uh, uh, but because of that, um, because of that, they moved Veterans Day for a, for a few years. And the veterans said, no, no, this is not right. This is, this is not with the history. The war ended on the 11th of November, and therefore, we need to, it needs to stay on the 11th no matter what day of the week it, fall, it falls on. And I think that's great. I think, and that, I think that's great that uh, people actually remembered history. Because the terrible Great War, uh, probably the first industrial scale war that involved most of the world, ended on November 11th at 11 a.m. on the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918. And so only recently we had the centennial of that. And in fact, I originally wrote a version of this article, uh, which was a lot more, uh, I guess a lot more better organized, <laughs> uh, uh, five years ago, which was on the 99th anniversary. To, now it's been 104. So. Anyway, like I said, it became Veterans Day because we wanted to celebrate veterans of other wars, which is all well and good, but we need to remember what the actual thrust of it was actually to celebrate peace. The, uh, the war, uh, the Great War is what they call it, killed 9 million combatants, 7 million civilians. I mean, this was a horrific, horrific war, and, and unlike other wars, you know, for example, World War II, there was really no clear uh, definition of who the good guys were because they were all, you know, colonial empires uh, that uh, that were, you know, partly free and partly authoritarian. And so, as much as they tried to demonize the Germans, they weren't all that much different than the Brits, for example. And in fact, they both fought. Uh, they fought both fought to oppress China in the Boxer Rebellion. And so, it's not like. Uh, not like there was a lot of difference between them. Now, the Great War, it was the first in a lot of things. I mean, it was kind of the first modern war. Uh, and uh, it was the first war where, where they used what we would now call weapons of mass destruction. In this case, poison gas. Widely used on the uh, battlefield. Really horrific. You know, you'd get enough, a whiff of that and it would destroy your lungs and you knew that you would die within 24 hours and there was really nothing they could do for you. It was really, really terrible. It was a very brutal war and it started with a political assassination which became a really big deal in the 20th century. Uh, and it was the Archduke Ferdinand of Austria and he and his wife were visiting the newly annexed province of Bosnia uh, when these anarchists, you know, popped out, and actually it was actually it was a kind of a crazy story because they threw a bomb in their carriage and it didn't kill them. It, it injured some of their guards. It took them to the hospital, and on the way back from the hospital is when they were ambushed again and shot. <laughs> uh, so uh, it was they were very determined, uh, these guys, and yet they didn't really know what they were trying to achieve, and what they did achieve was World War, because the uh, Austrians ended up blaming Serbia, uh, the next country next door, uh, for stirring up this trouble, and uh, so they ended up declaring war in Serbia, 
And because they had allies and the Serbs had allies, it ended up involving all of Europe and eventually other countries uh, as in other parts of the world as well. Uh, the, what we had was, for those of you who are historically challenged, a lot at which in which case a lot of Americans are right now, uh, they there were two groups: the Axis, which was the Germans, the Empire of Austria-Hungary. It was those two countries, and they had a, they ruled a bunch of the countries around them, and, and they had like, you know, a single monarch that that ruled all of those, and uh, the Ottoman Empire, which we now call Turkey, which is like the remnant of that. So these three countries were kind of in a line, so they called it the Axis, and uh, the other countries were called allies. Uh, not that uh, not that the other ones weren't allies too. And that term, you know, continued on to the next next war. Uh, uh, and I guess they also called them ones central powers because they were in the center of Europe. The Germans got in on the side of Austria, and of course the Russians were supporting their Slavic brothers, the Serbs, and and uh, you know the French and the English eventually joined in, and so that started in 1914. And after quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of uh, fighting and a, a stalemate for a long time, the Americans got involved as well. So anyway, it was it was a as I was saying, it was a, a time of brutality. They had trench warfare, where they, the men would dig in, especially in Belgium. Poor Belgium. Got, got the worst of it because the Germans, you know, invaded and the French pushed them back, and because it sort of lies in between, and uh, the men were in these trenches, you know, popping up and shooting at each other, and the, the front would move by a few inches every month, that kind of thing, and it was all seemed very futile, but it just kept going, and because of this, the um, the governments had to be kind of brutal to uh, motivate the troops. Uh, for example, this was one of the few times when all, when the conscription, that is the draft, uh, was almost universal. And in fact, it wasn't like it wasn't just that you know they had you had to have military training like in Switzerland. No, it was they were you know basically plucked out of their homes and and sent to fight and die in on foreign soil. And so because you know they they were running out of guys, it was so brutal. You know, they had poison gas, they had machine guns, the Germans were big on that. And uh, the other guys, the French and the English particularly, didn't know how to handle that. They would just send their men to charge these machine gun nests. They'd be mowed down and slaughtered like, you know, slaughtered like chickens, basically. And uh, they'd say no. If the men would say, no, we don't want to go, then they, they'd charge them with desertion and shoot them. <laughs> so, yeah, it was very brutal. And, and a lot of horrible propaganda. That was another thing that, that this war was big on, was propaganda. You know, and whereas I'm not as aware of what the, on the other side, what they did, I'm, I'm sure they did it as well. On the western side, they were portraying the Germans particularly as baby killers, which was absurd. I mean, they were no worse than the other side, certainly. And because of that, the idea was you dehumanize the other side, and they'll be your your troops will be more likely to want to kill them. But interestingly enough, it didn't work as well as they thought. For example, in 1914, at Christmas, uh, the German and British troops, uh, you know, on the, in the trenches, they unilaterally decided to declare a truce for for Christmas and Christmas Eve, and they traded gifts, you know, primarily like food and tobacco and and uh, whatever liquor they had, and you know they sang Christmas carols and stuff. <laughs> it's it's an amazing outbreak of humanity <laughs> among in, in humanity. It's really inspiring, and I think they I think they've done movies about that and stuff. Uh, at least I know there are books about it. Another first uh, of this era of the Great War era was the use of political subversion, and particularly the Germans were good at this. The Germans were trying to stir up trouble in, uh, for example, uh, the Kaiser, well this was before the war, but like the Kaiser went to Morocco, which was under the French thumb, and, and was talking about how the Mor Moroccan king should be sovereign. <laughs> the French didn't like that. <laughs> they were trying to stir up the Indians against the, Brit the uh, British, uh, who ruled them at the time. But, but most importantly, 
the, the one successful thing they did was to send Vladimir Lenin, the uh, notorious revolutionary communist, in a sealed rail car into Russia, where he'd been banned. I don't know why the Russians didn't just shoot him. <laughs> they, they, they say the Tsar was so, so brutal, and yet, you know, I don't know, they let him live, and he was living in, in London at the time. They took uh, Lenin, put him into Russia, where he helped foment the revolution, which eventually took Russia out of the war. They became communist, and they, there was a horrible bloodbath. So, you know, that was the use of propaganda and subversion on, you know, on basically on both sides of the war. You know, and it's interesting that they came back to bite the Germans because the Germans had a communist revolution too at the time, although it was not successful. One of the reasons that the Germans were so uh, afraid of communism and willing to follow the man who promised to protect them from that, the man with the funny little mustache, uh, is because they saw how brutal and how horrible uh, the Bolsheviks treated the Russian population. You know, it's interesting because a lot of these people were ethnic minorities uh, in Russia. You know, uh, they, were, they were Jewish, they were Lithuanians, they were Poles, uh, Georgians, and all this stuff. And, and they were, you know, up for revenge. <laughs> So when Germany nearly went communist and, and they, you know, dodged that bullet and, and uh, therefore they wanted to make sure they didn't. Uh, another thing where World War I was a first was how much the mass media influenced the war. We talked about propaganda, but they also had, you know, public reaction. Uh, like the Kaiser, I was I was saying how he tried to subvert, uh, how we tried to subvert different countries, different colonies that is of the of his of his rivals, and he made a lot of statements that were really angered the other world leaders, which hmm, sounds a lot like a couple recent, two recent U.S. presidents. And he called the Brits as mad as March hares. Interestingly, because interesting enough, because he was the the grandson of of Queen Victoria. <laughs> like, they were all related, these, these royals. And another speech he gave where he wanted the, the, uh, the Germans to be brutal as Huns in putting down the Boxer Rebellion in China, that's where the term Hun came from. That they, that it was a slander against the Germans because they were calling them Huns. And I always wondered, weren't the Huns, like, kind of Asian? <laughs> well, they were, I mean, they gave their name to Hungary, but nonetheless, yeah, it was because of his, uh, of his speech, I guess. And, you know, finally, there was this really punitive peace that, uh, that was imposed upon Germany. Well, Austria-Hungary was completely dismembered. But Germany, they left that together, but they, they charged them with reparations. They really punished, it, punished Germany. They took all of their industrial equipment and they made them pay millions and millions of marks to uh, France and Britain and claimed that they were the only ones responsible uh, and uh, that made the Germans impoverished. They were going hungry. They were, um, in fact, the Brits blockaded Germany after they surrendered to make sure they uh, agreed to these unfair terms. It caused uh, hyperinflation and again led to the guy with the funny little mustache taking power. So all of these things uh, were, you know, predecessor to worse things. Uh, I read an interesting book, an interesting nonfiction book about that called Wilson's War by a guy named Jim Powell who basically blamed uh, President Wilson for uh, causing a lot of these things, inadvertently of course, because he came in on, he brought the U.S. in on what had been a stalemate. Um, and, you know, and of course we had fake, fake provocations, as, as they always do. You know, the, the Lusitania and so on, which was a British ship that was sunk that had Americans on it who died, sunk by the Germans. And yet, you know, it was, it was carrying weapons of war. And so it was violating, you know, it was violating the uh, principle that a civilian ship should not be engaged in war. So therefore, it was not really a provocation. 
And yet, of course, you know, the mass media and their, their willingness to do propaganda, they went along with that. According to Jim Powell, it was all due to Woodrow Wilson <laughs> and tipping the balance. Uh, as far as fiction, I'm sure, I know there's been a lot of fiction written about World, World War I, the Great War. I haven't read much of it. I really haven't. I mean, All Quiet on the Western Front is a classic uh, uh, written by a German soldier about the kind of experiences he went through. And uh, the steampunk classic Leviathan by Scott Westerfeld imagines a an alternate World War I that uh, fought between... Uh, the uh, Allies and their genetic engineering and uh, the Axis and their uh, their robotics, their advanced robotics, which is really a, kind of an entertaining and fun book. And it, it ends a lot sooner than in the real than in the real world. You know, these days, we don't talk about much about that war at all. I mean, World War II, of course, still gets talked about, still has a lot of fiction about it. Um, but... Uh, a lot of people are willing to admit, yeah, it was probably a mistake that we got involved, the U.S., that is. At the same time, at the same time, it's interesting, the neoconservative, the war, warmonger types, they like to say, oh, no, it was, it was important. It was important for us to fight for democracy, which is what they always say. And really, there was essentially no difference, really no difference between, you know, like the, the German Empire and the British Empire, for example. So, it's, it's a very interesting and fascinating period of, of history, and something that was pivotal, uh, even though it happened uh, a little over a century ago, it's a very, very important to what the world is like today. So I really advise you to check it out, you know, check it out, read some articles, read, you know, you know start with Wikipedia, which is, you know, the very Cliff Notes version, <laughs> and then we'll move on to move on to better things that have more complete stories, complete stories about what really happened. And uh, you'll be better informed and you'll be better able to make decisions as a voter and so on. Uh, so this has been my talk in celebration of Veterans Day, aka Armistice Day, and why it came about and uh, why we celebrated on the 11th of November and so on. Uh, please let me know what you think about it in the comments below, and please also like and subscribe, uh, because that helps us get out the good steampunk word for now. This is the Steampunk Desperado saying, adios amigos, from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future, and the present is extraordinary.